So I guess thanks for the introduction. I might just run through a little bit more about who I am and more about what's important to me. So I'm a software developer at REA Group. That's um, these guys. I'm a polyglot. I like to claim that. I come from a long history of Java. Um, I may have written something before Java, but we won't go into that. Get me drunk and you might find out. Um, I've also written JavaScript and Ruby in my time. Currently, I'm mostly writing Scala. That's probably relevant. The examples today are going to be in Scala, just because that's what I write at the moment. OK, what do I need to do? So what's important to me? So this is what I get paid to do. I get paid to deliver business functionality efficiently. That's probably important. I don't get paid to know about functional programming. I don't get paid to write pure code. I get paid to produce business functionality. OK, so to do this and keep my bosses happy and keep me well paid, I need to write code. But more importantly, when I write code, I'm probably writing code in existing systems. So it's really important for me that I can read and reason about existing code, which helps me maintain it, enhance it, all those lovely words. OK, so I have one thing. When someone gives me a new programming technique, I have one code metric that I apply to it. How many cups of coffee am I going to require per line of code that uses this technique? That pretty much applies. Doesn't matter what language. Doesn't matter if it's Scala, Ruby, JavaScript. How many cups of coffee do I need? Small cups of coffee. This is Melbourne. That's not an espresso. That's not a really strong cup of coffee. That's a small <laughs> cup of coffee. Make me really happy. I love things that require less coffee. Things that require lots of coffee. I get pretty frustrated and maybe even a little bit angry. OK, so we're here to talk about exceptions. I guess the first question is, why wouldn't we want to use exceptions? We've used exceptions for a long time. Most of those languages I just told you about, exceptions. That's how we do it. Something goes wrong, we throw an exception. OK. After we've worked out why we don't want to use exceptions, we're going to work out how we're going to handle errors. Because do you know what? In the real world, things really do go wrong. So we might throw out exceptions as a technique. We're going to need to do something instead. OK, I work writing professional software. We're going to look at some real world examples. Often people give me techniques, and I don't really get how I can apply them every day. So we're going to run through a few examples taken from the REA world. And then at the end, I'm going to show you how this is going to save me caffeine. <laughs> OK, before we start, I'd like you to meet someone. This is Adam. <laughs> Okay, Adam really existed. He didn't want me to put his uh, picture up here. <laughs> Adam um, was my pair. At REA, we do a lot of pairing. When I first moved into this functional world, Adam was my pair. Adam really is quite a whiz at this functional programming stuff. He spoke pretty fluently in the worlds of category theory and other such things, which I didn't speak. Um, and I didn't understand a lot of what Adam said to me. I certainly didn't see how it related to my caffeine intake. So Adam's here today, and he's going to tell us some words of FP wisdom. We may not dig in too far to them, but we will tie it back to the things you might hear. I may not explain all of what he says, but at least you'll hear it. OK, so first of all, why wouldn't we use exceptions? Well, the classic things that you hear in an FP world, don't use exceptions. They break referential transparency. I think someone said this to me, and I was like, Nye. don't really care. <laughs> Up in the things I need to achieve every day, yeah, that's nice. I'm not writing you know, university exercises. No one's going to mark me on whether I break referential transparency. <laughs> it's not a KPI. <laughs> it's not a KPI. <laughs> OK, so let's actually look at a real world example. And just in case anyone's wondering, and hello to my team who are up here somewhere. Um, we actually found this in our code when I was looking for an example, so that was awesome. So let's have a look at this piece of code. That's Scala. 
might just cover off how to read this first. How many people here write or have written Scala? Oh, OK, we're going to go through this really fast. OK, that's my function name. My function takes some parameters. They have a name, and we're in a typed language, so they've got some types. And that's what I'm going to get back. And there's my body. It's just wrapping up the uh, maximum for my vector of integers and popping it in a string and telling me what it is. Awesome. Let's have a little look at that method there. That's the standard library method. It's on a vector of integers, in fact, any vector. It's the maximum, and the return type there tells me it's going to give me back an integer. Awesome, it's going to do what I want. And that's what the person who wrote this code thought. Unfortunately, we had a problem. And the problem was that what if that vector is empty? What's it going to do? And no prizes, it's going to throw an exception. Now, nothing there told me it was going to throw an exception. And we might think I should have known, but as I said, this was a real world example. Someone missed it. So we actually didn't know, and we put it into production. <coughs> so here we go. Exceptions reduce my ability to reason about code. Nothing about that told me it was going to throw an exception. <coughs> and that's the real problem. OK, let's just wrap up our max. So this is what we might do instead of throwing an exception. We're going to just wrap up that max age function, and we're going to say that it's going to return something called a try. So if you look at my return signature now, it's going to return a try of an int. So it's trying to give me back an integer, but it's telling me in the return signature that it might not. OK, my try is just a sealed trait. That means it's got two possible implementations. It's either going to be a success or it's going to be a failure. If it's going to be a failure, it's going to wrap the exception. And if it's going to be a success, it's going to give me back the integer inside that success object. <coughs> OK. Um, there's a nice little utility function that I'm not going to dig into today. But if you wrap up any code that throws an exception, that little try that I've wrapped around it, We'll just catch that exception and turn it into a try object. So either a success, if it didn't find an exception, if it found an exception, it's going to give me back an error, a failure. OK, so let's have a look at what my rewritten method looks like. So now I'm actually going to have to deal with the fact that I've got a try. So I'm going to match on the try. If I've got a success, Sure, I'm going to return the string I did before, but now my type signature has told me that I'm actually going to have to do something else in the failure case. So in this case, I'm just going to deal with it there and then. I'm going to give back a different string and let you know that I couldn't give you back what you wanted. So when we have no error and when we have an error. OK, that was good. Could be there. And often this is where we stop, but... I'm kind of clever, and I now have learnt that my max age might give me back an exception. Or might, sorry, yes, might give me back an exception. So I'm actually not going to call it this time. I'm going to check whether my vector is empty first, and I'm going to deal with that situation straight away. Hmm. I'm going to create a failure, but I had to write an exception to create that failure object. You remember I told you that it's going to wrap up the exception. So if I want to tell you that it failed, I'm going to have to create an exception. And I'm kind of nervous now, so I've wrapped this up in a try as well, just in case there was anything else they forgot to tell me about. Hmm. Now, I said at the top I was going to tell you about an exception-free world. And you'll excuse me, but I just created another exception, and that doesn't look particularly exception-free for me. So. We've got a return type that tells me about it, but I'm creating exceptions all over the place. Sort of not what I told you I'd do. So let's have another go. We don't do that, by the way. OK. Let's create our own error class. It's a fairly simple case object. It's got a message in it. Now, I have popped in there a throwable 
So this is our exception. That's kind of just in case. So I still want to be able to wrap up third-party code. And if it does give me an exception, and I learned this the hard way, often there's useful information in there. So I don't really want to just throw it away, but I'm only going to use that if I'm wrapping up somebody else's exception. Mostly, I'm just going to use the message. OK, we're going to call, use a Scala Z disjunction to create our return type. Who here knows about Scala Z disjunctions? Ooh, a few hands. A few hands not up. OK. Well, we write it like this. This is just a type alias. So we're going to call it an error or, and it's going to return any type. So you'll remember the, before we had the try that could wrap any type. Now we've got an error or that can wrap any type. The Scala Z disjunction is actually um, longhand, written with this funny little symbol. It's actually a method thing. Don't ask. OK, back to safe land. Um, that will look very like our try looked. So we've got an abstract class at the top, where there's an A or a B. In this case, we're saying our A is always our app error. We have the failure case. This is supposed to indicate a left. That's why it's kind of written with the funny symbols and the little line. And this is the right. Play on words, it's correct. OK, let's have a look at how our code looks with that. OK, I've just rewritten out what we had before. Looks kind of similar. I've got a nice informative return type. I'm going to get an error or my thing back. I didn't have to create an exception now. I've just created an app error that contains a, me a, me a message. So that's kind of nice. Oh, and this one, I'm going to skip over this quite fast, but this is just a little utility method that also will wrap third-party code. So we've got it there. <coughs> OK, why did we use a Scala Z either? Hmm. Why didn't we use a Scala either? That's there in the library. That was one of my questions. I was like, yeah, that seems unnecessary. Adam had something to say on that. He said, Scala, uh, Scala's either is not right, biased. And I went, yay. No KPI around that. <laughs> then he came up with even more words. Didn't mean a lot to me. OK, the Scala's disjunction comes with type class instances for functor, monad, applicative, and more. Whoa! Starting to feel like a lot of coffee now. I'm like, whoa, not sure I want to go there. Exceptions sounding great. OK, before we can dig into that a bit longer, we're going to have to come up with a mental model for type classes. OK, we've only got mm, about another 15 minutes together, so we're going to keep this really, really simple. OK, now, for those of you that know a bit more, this is a really, really simple, but this is all we need to get through what we need to get through today. So a really simple model. I want you to think of those type classes. So if my disjunction has a functor instance, what that means for the purposes of this talk is it's a bag full of methods that kind of get automatically added to my class. So that's all we need to know. I've got a bag of methods, and they get added to my class. So functor gives me a few methods, monads, yeah, the famous flat map method, lots of others as well, applicatives, some more methods, and traversable some more methods. So we're going to interpret what Adam told us as just, eh, we've got a bunch of methods. Awesome. <laughs> OK. Why would that help us? So now we're going to have a look at a real world example so that we can see what we could do with errors that we might need these things. I'm going to need to create a little example for you, because the 10 lines of code we looked at before isn't going to be quite complex enough to get through this. OK. I work for these people, realestate.com.au. We deal with real estate agents. What we do is we advertise properties. Oh, we might model the real estate agent. So it's going to be nice and simple. I've got an ID that I identify them by, and I've got a name. And these real estate agents, they have properties on our site. We're going to link them up with their agent with an agent ID. And there we go. There's my class for the property. So that's all the model we're going to create today. Let's store them. 
So we'll put them in some kind of store. Now, obviously, this would normally be some kind of database or key value store. For today, we're going to create a map. So it's just a map that goes from the identity to the object. I'm going to do the same for properties. So we've got two maps. OK, when we get something from our store, it doesn't really matter if it's a map or anything else. It might be there and it might not. So if I'm going to go to my store and get something, I might get the thing. I might get an error. Let's write that down. OK, so there's my get agent. I get an error or I get an agent. Now, this is just an implementation detail, but actually the get on a map in Scala gives you back a, an option. So I've just converted them with a case class, a case match statement. So in the case of none, so we've done that. We get the agent based on the ID. In the case of none, we get back the agent or we get back an error. Sorry. <laughs> So there we go, an error if we didn't find it, and an agent wrapped up in the disjunction right if we did. And there's the same thing, it's just copy-paste, that's bad, but hey, for the uh, properties. Okay, so what might we want to do? So here's something I might actually want to do. Given the agent ID, tell me the agent's name. If you can't find the agent, then I want the error. So it might look something like that. We might wrap it up in a string. And we might write out a method signature. So I'm going to report the agent name. I'm going to take the agent ID. And I'm going to get an error or string. Now, you remember, we know how to get an agent and get an error or agent based on the ID, but I want the agent's name. So how do I get from there to my error or string? Hi, Adam. Adam always comes up with helpful, useful tips when I'm pairing with him. Mm, it's a functor. Awesome. Look at the map method that the functor gives us. OK, let's take a look. OK, we're going to run through this a little bit slowly so we get the hang of this. So my map method on my error or a Hmm. Well, I don't have an error or A. I have an error or agent. So let's write down that type. Adam told me to follow the types. We'll write down the type. Error or agent is error or A. Ah, that's cool. I can see my A needs to be an agent. OK, let's look at what we want back. We've got an error or string that we want back. We write that down. Cool, my B is a string. OK, so now I can look at this little function definition. Um, so this says that I need a function that's going to go from my agent to my string, which is just my string that I had at the top. OK, let's take a look. OK, well, I'm just going to take my agent. I'm going to get my agent name. And then I can wrap it up in that string at the top. Awesome. Cool. So now, there's my method. I'm going to get back an error or string. So I've done something in the case where I had a success, and I've done nothing in the case where I had a failure. Let's have another look at a different example. So this time, we have a property ID. OK, we're going to go through this really fast then. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we've got a property ID. I want to get the agent for the property. So I can tell what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to look up the property by the ID, and then I'm going to use that agent's ID to find the agent. If either of those go wrong, I'm going to get an error. OK, there's my method. There are the two things I've got. Hi, Adam. Oh, it's a monad. I'm going to use the flat map method. So I'm going to follow the same process again. I've got an error or property. Cool. A is a property. Error or agent. Cool. B is an agent. There's my method. It's going to go from a property to an error or agent. Cool. I'm going to write out my method. That's going to take my property. I'm going to get my agent ID, and I'm going to get my agent. There we go. I've combined two errors there. So the first method might have thrown an error. The second one might have thrown an error. 
Okay, we're going to do one more, and then we'll get on to our point. So, given a list, oh, we're going to. Okay, given the list of agents, find the agents. Tell me whether you found each one. Cool. Hi, Adam. Mm, map method. Cool. Vector of A. Okay, I'm going to have an int. My A is an int. Okay, here my B is an error or agent. Cool. So my G is just going to take my agent ID and give me an error or agent. Cool, I know how to do that. So I can map over my vector or my list of agents and get back what I need. Okay, given a list of agents, give me all the agents, but one of my agents doesn't exist. Give me back an error. Okay, we're almost out of time. I'm going to whiz through this. You can look back through the slides and see how I do this, but I'm going to follow the types. And here I've picked up the sequence method. That's a pretty scary signature, but I can follow those types. My A is a vector of error or... Sorry, my A is an error or agent. Cool. That must mean that my G is an error or, and my B is an agent. Cool, I've got an applicative. So let's write out that G, a vector of B. That's just error or, vector of an agent. That was just slotting in the types. Oh, that was what I need. Cool. But I'm just going to get my agents and pop them to sequence. Actually, that was pretty cool. I didn't have to fold. I didn't have to do anything. I combined up my whole list of errors there and got back either an error or my whole list of values that I wanted. That was pretty easy. OK, I'm going to click through these, because Lyndon and Noon are going to kill me. <laughs> so I had a few more examples for you. So we had an example that was going to look at separate. That was kind of cool. I was going to get back a list of all my app errors, together with a list of all the things that came back right. So if I had a list of agent IDs, and some of them were going to give me errors, and some of them were going to give me back things that actually gave me agents, I can get those back in two separate lists. Just call the separate method. Cool. That wasn't much code. OK. If we got through all that, we would have seen lots of ways to deal with our errors. OK, we saw how to compose them. We saw how to combine them. There were some very useful methods there that we got. Actually, we didn't really do anything. We followed the types, and we picked out some already generic functions. I didn't have to use folds. I didn't have to use recursion. Just kind of finding the right things out of my bags. And we didn't need to use any special exception handling syntax. So that's important. I didn't need to learn how to handle exceptions in this language. And this is a long bow. But it turns out that the same methods are available on futures. If I wanted to deal with asynchronous code, options, free monads, I think we might hear about those later. <coughs> so very small amounts of caffeine needed. And makes me very happy. So it's quite powerful. OK, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Learning it requires quite a lot of co coffee. OK, this wasn't easy mm, actually working out how to write it in the first place took quite a lot of effort. But I would suggest to you that learning it gave me some tools that I can reapply in lots of situations and lots of languages. Hmm. I was lucky. I work at REA, we pair. I had an Adam. Adam kind of sat there, and as he did today, he told me all about these methods that I might use. That was kind of useful. I'm guessing that not all of you have an Adam. OK, so here's some recommendations. If you're working in Scala, I really, really like this book, the FP in Scala. So this one really, really sort of um, helped me understand what Adam was trying to say to me. Um, today, I did the examples using Scala Z. <coughs> I actually, probably if I was starting again, I wouldn't use it. I would use the CATS library. It comes with really great documentation. It's not quite released yet. I believe it's any day now, but I'm not sure. Um, but the documentation is awesome. And in fact, I find myself reading the CATS documentation and then reapplying it to the Scala Z library. So I am hoping that I have drawn for you there why I might choose not to use exceptions in the future, how I might handle exceptions. And please, I'm sure the slides will be up somewhere, so go back through some of the other examples that I drew up. 
Okay, and we made it. Hopefully these guys are not going to 